Cambridge IGCSE Biology Major 2020 Paper 43. Let's go. Question 4. Xerophytes grow in habitats with low rainfall and soils that often have high concentrations of salt. Figure 4.1 shows the xerophyte Yucca charculiana growing on salt flats. Part A. Explain why xerophytes such as Y. charculiana are adapted to absorb sufficient water in the conditions in which they live. What are the characteristics of these kind of plants that allow it to live in places with very little or no rain and also places that are quite salty so it's hard for the plants to absorb water from the ground by osmosis? So first of all, they have very deep roots to absorb water from the water table. Water table is basically a layer of water deep under the ground so you need deep roots to reach it. Then the roots are very long and they spread out below the surface to absorb water as much as possible when it rains or just to absorb the ones that are already present underground. To add on, the root cells will generally have low water potential so that they can absorb water by osmosis even though the soils are very salty. Lastly, the roots branch many times and they have lots of root hairs so this will give a large surface area and thus have high rates of absorption of water. Take note that you're not supposed to write all these points to get full marks. I've written 10 points and you just need to write 4 of these to get a full mark. So it's quite easy to score if you know what kind of answers you're supposed to write. Usually one mark is for stating and another mark for explaining why the feature is useful. Explain how xerophytes are adapted to reduce water loss to the atmosphere. Previously, we talked about how they can efficiently absorb water and now we're going to talk about how to reduce water loss. Well, how does a plant lose its water? It's through their leaves and specifically two parts from the leaves. The first one is the stomata, so the plants will have few stomata compared to normal plants and the stomata will stay closed during the day when the temperature is too high and it will open at night when the temperature is much lower. Then next, to reduce the water loss, the second part is it will have a very thick epidermis or very thick cuticle so that water will not easily evaporate off from the surface of the leaves. Regarding the structures of the leaves, the leaves will be rolled up to have less area exposed to the sun or some may just have no leaves or very few leaves. Another thing is there can be hairs on leaves to prevent evaporation and generally there will be low rates of transpiration. Xerophytes often have many defense mechanisms that reduce or prevent herbivores eating them, so just how xerophytes protect themselves against herbivores. Think of a cactus or a pineapple, they have needles or spines, so it makes it very hard for animals to reach it and start eating it. Also, some of them contain toxins and just foul-tasting substances, so normally the animals will not even go near it, and some even have very thick, inedible leaves, able to protect themselves against from the herbivores. Part B. Forest ecosystems can be affected by acid rain. Describe how the production of acid rain and its effects on the forest ecosystems can be reduced. Why is there acid rain in the first place? It's because of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane, and ozone, and so on. So what we can do is reduce air pollution. There, you already got one mark. And now we explain how to reduce air pollution. 
Well, the fastest way is to reduce the use of coal and other fossil fuels, so we produce less carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and so on. And we can also use catalytic converters in our cars so that carbon monoxide can be converted to carbon dioxide and nitrogen dioxide can be converted to nitrogen gas. Furthermore, instead of using fossil fuels, we can use alternative sources of power such as using the energy from the sun or hydroelectric power or using wind turbines to generate energy. You can also suggest examples of ways to reduce demand for energy such as save electricity, turn off the aircon and the lights when you're not using them. Other than this, you can also talk about the soils. Having a very acidic soils nearby the river or the sea is one of the ways of producing acid rain, so try to raise the pH of soils, make it more basic by adding lime, and prevent the acidic substances flowing into the water. Question 5. Bacteria are classified in the prokaryote kingdom. Part A state two features of animal and plant cells that are not found in prokaryotes. Yes, you definitely need to know the answer for this. It's a very common question. Firstly, prokaryotes do not have nucleus, so they do not have any chromosomes. Also, they do not have any mitochondrion, endoplasmic reticulum, and vacuoles. Part B. Methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus MRSA is a type of bacterium that is resistant to some antibiotics. Figure 5.1 shows how a population of bacteria may develop antibiotic resistance and how the antibiotic resistance can be passed from one strain of bacterium to another. We have a diagram here showing the processes. Let's first look at the key. The shaded ones are the ones that are resistant to antibiotic Z and the ones that are not shaded are not resistant to antibiotic Z. And the one shown in dotted lines are the dying bacterium. And these pieces here show the strain of bacterium. Again, the shaded ones are the ones that are resistant, and the others are the ones that are not resistant. And the circle is a plasmid. So firstly, they had one bacterium that is resistant to antibiotic Z, and the rest were not resistant to antibiotic Z. So when they first started their treatment with antibiotic Z, the other bacteria will be affected by this antibiotic Z, but the shaded one, this one, will not be affected by it since it's resistant to it. Okay, then as a result, this was taken in the middle of treatment. You can see that the one that was resistant to antibiotic Z has multiplied and became 4. But the ones that were not resistant to antibiotic Z have disappeared and started dying like this, shown in dotted lines. Okay, then when they have stopped the treatment with antibiotic Z, you can see that there's much more of the bacterium that are resistant to antibiotic Z. And the ones that were not resistant to antibiotic Z have diminished in their numbers. So as a result, after using antibiotic Z as a treatment, the bacteria that are resistant to antibiotic Z have multiplied, but the ones that are not resistant to antibiotic Z have reduced. Okay, then after they're left like this, this bacteria was transmitted to patient 2. To do that, they first took out the plasmid of the bacteria that are resistant to antibiotic Z, then the bacterium of strain that were not resistant to antibiotic Z became resistant in the end. These were what the diagram tried to show, and let's go to the question. Explain how resistance to an antibiotic develops in a population of bacteria and spreads in the human population. This is a pretty important question because it's worth 6 marks, and you really have to understand this diagram properly in order to answer this question, or else it may be pretty challenging. So as stated in the question, the resistance to an antibiotic develops in a population of bacteria within its own, then spreads in the human population. It's shown in the diagram that 
The first three drawings here represent the bacteria with resistance multiplying by themselves and the last one showing that it can be transmitted to patient 2 which is a human. Okay, first of all, resistance arises by mutation. It's not like the shaded ones are some different species, they're the same species and all that, but somehow by mutation, some of them will just be produced with certain resistance. Then, as you can see, let's say these bacteria were treated with an antibiotic. For here, it was treated with antibiotic Z. These antibiotic Z will start killing the ones without the resistance. Well, obviously, because the ones with resistance will not be affected by this antibiotic. So then, the shaded ones, these resistant bacteria will have absolutely no competition. The antibiotic is killing all its competitors, so it's just there to reproduce and keep on passing on their alleles for resistance. So that's why in the third diagram here, it's shown that the bacteria with resistance was able to multiply so quickly while the bacteria without the resistance died off due to the antibiotic Z. We have a term that specifies this whole process, it's called natural selection. Basically, the bacteria with resistance was able to survive because it carried an allele with an advantage, which is having the resistance against the antibiotic Z, and it continued to pass on its genes to its offspring and reproducing, and in the end, the whole population of bacteria having the resistance. Then these may spread in the human population, so when one person gets infected by this bacteria, this person can infect the other person by coughing or having some bodily fluid contact or just skin-to-skin -skin contact. Then in the end, it just spreads in the human population. Part C. Explain how the development of resistant bacteria such as MRSA can be minimized. The most effective way is to control the usage of antibiotics. So you don't use it too often and you only use it when it's necessary so that we don't cause these bacteria to start gaining resistance against the antibiotic. Also, don't use it for viral infections because then there will be higher chance of bacteria having the resistance in a large population of people. This is a famous one, make sure people complete the course of antibiotics because you need to make sure that you kill off all the bacteria in your body or else the remaining ones will start gaining resistance again. Furthermore, we need to continue to develop new antibiotics because one day the bacteria are going to gain resistance and we need to keep on making new antibiotics to kill off the mutated bacteria. Lastly, the person should not use the same antibiotics for a long time. It's not going to be effective because once you start using it for a few months, the bacteria inside your body would have already gained some resistance against it. So use different types of antibiotics. And also you can use different combinations of antibiotics. Oh, and you can also include that everyone can have good hygiene to prevent the spread of infection so that you don't even have to use an antibiotic in the first place. And even though someone carries a bacteria with resistance against the bacteria, if the infection is not spread, then other people will not get the bacteria with the resistance against the antibiotic. Question 6. In many parts of the world, dairy cattle are kept in large barns and reared intensively as shown in figure 6.1. There are a lot of cows here. Part A, food for cattle that are reared intensively includes cereals such as maize and barley. Ecologists have calculated that it is more energy efficient to grow crops for human consumption than for food for livestock. Explain why intensive rearing of livestock is not an efficient use of crops. Well, usually in the food chain, we have plants at the bottom, then animals like cows, and then we have humans on top. You need to remember that as you go along the food chain, you are losing a lot of energy. Actually, 90% of energy is lost, so in the end, humans are only getting 10%. 
Since energy is lost at each trophic level in the food chain, it's much more efficient for the crops to be directly consumed by humans instead of consuming cows, which will have 90% less energy compared to plants. Also, the cows will lose their own energy by, you know, sweating and excretion, digestion and all that. So overall, there will be just less energy available to humans if they consume cows. So it's much more energy efficient to directly consume the plants. Part B. The urine and feces from cattle kept in barns is removed and treated in the same way as human sewage to avoid polluting the aquatic environment. Outline the effects of untreated waste from cattle on the aquatic environment. What would happen if people start dumping the cow poos and peas and all that into the river directly? The most obvious feature is that there will be smell or visual pollution. It's gonna look and smell disgusting. And also, because those wastes generally carry a lot of bacteria and virus, there will be increased risk of waterborne diseases. Then moving on, we have another point that since these untreated wastes are actually the organic content, there will be increased organic content of rivers or lakes, and the bacteria and the decomposers living in the river will start feeding on it and grow at a fast rate and they're gonna start using up all the oxygen dissolved in the water and the other organisms like fish, frogs and all those will have less oxygen because of those bacteria in decomposers taking in all the oxygen. So then the other organisms will start dying and this is called the eutrophication. Part C. Intensive livestock production can be one way of preventing famine. Describe the causes of famine. Okay, famine means there's not enough food, so one cause is that there's just lack of food supply or unequal distribution of food. So in some parts of the world, some people have too much food. In other parts of the world, there's lack of food. And there can be many reasons behind this, firstly because of wars, so there will be no source of food. And there can be natural disasters like droughts or floods that killed all the crops and the livestock that you produced. Then there can be diseases in the animals, so it won't be consumable anymore. And lastly, it's due to poverty, so some people cannot afford to buy food and have it for themselves. Tell me in the comments if you found this paper easy or hard and like this video if it helped you. Subscribe if you want to get ready for your IGCSE exams. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and God bless you guys. Bye.